but hello everyone. Thank you again for joining us. We're delighted you're here um, for milking sustainability with taste. And so that's going to be learning as well as experiential, which obviously many of us have done before we sat down with artisanal cheeses. Um, and before we move into the program with these presenters, I just thought I'd have a few different highlights of, of our sustainability programming with some more specifics, uh, because it is rather different in Fairfield County from a geographic state standpoint. Um, and so sustainability, first off, is very diverse. Um, a lot of subsectors, it's very opinionated. And so what we do is we as a staff uh, in Haven, we try and come up with sustainability topics that will best resonate with our audiences, meaning those that are either members or non-members. And so to give some people, who, if you're not a member, a semblance of what we've done, um, some of the examples from a content standpoint have been um, eliminating chemicals, empowering water stewardship, that's been a, one of them over to living the circular economy lifestyle, which is zero waste. Um, another one was refashioning the future of conscious consumption, specific to fashion, and many, many more. So if some of these themes do um, resonate with you personally or professionally, I would encourage you to go to the Haven site, and they then launch onto YouTube. Um, so, and they're not just about content and presenters, there's key takeaways that is integral to these kinds of programming. It's not just about expertise with views. We like interaction with questions because, again, it's about key takeaways that hopefully can benefit all of you. And so with that said, um, tonight we have two Connecticut-based industry leaders uh, born and bred in Connecticut, one, one of them on a dairy farm, to share not just expertise and views, but also answer questions that we will make it very interactive, but hopefully um, again, constructive for your needs. Um, and so before we go into some of the bios, I just thought I would also introduce our community partner, um, Ali from the um, Food Shed Network and Greenwich Food Alliance, Ali Giorzi. And she wants to just come up for a few moments and express what that's about as our community partner. First of all, thank you so much, um, Lisa and Felicia and Kevin, um, for extending the invitation to be a community partner in this event. Um, it's been a pleasure um, working with you. Um, so I'm Ali Giorsi, and I'm the founder of the Food Shed Network. Uh, Food Shed is an emerging nonprofit organization um, that educates and convenes around uh, food system transformation. So, in short, I'm educating people on the gravity of our industrial food system, why it is so important to support Amaya yogurt and uh, Cato Corner Farms. Um, our industrial system is a leading cause of biodiversity loss, climate change, water pollution, racial inequities. It's really big, heavy stuff. And the solutions really um, are pathway out of it and are, are in the small community-based organizations and farming initiatives. And so I work to promote that um, by way of the Food Shed Forum, which is the convening partner this evening, um, through panel discussions, um, experiential events, and then the Greenwich Food Alliance, which is a community practice of thought leaders within, within Greenwich that are working towards, towards a better a better food system and policy is an, is an aspect of that and i also work on different levels statewide and regional but for now just leave it at that thank you thank you so much so we'll begin just um i think with bios from both of uh, our presenters that i'll just introduce briefly to both to everyone um starting with hamilton hamilton is the founder and ceo of an organic 100 percent grass-fed yogurt called maya and it has distribution both online and offline. Um, and just to go a bit about with what he's done before being CEO of Maya, um, initially after college, he went to Colgate University um, with a degree in economics and German. And he then went into being an owner of restaurants. So quite a formidable task for anyone, several restaurants. And from there, um, he went to JP Morgan for seven years as an associate in their investment banking division. And then in 2012 or thereabouts, um, he started and founded Maya. And everyone's got a story, so very briefly tonight, his story is that his cousin, who was pregnant, had some sugar issues, and he, on his stove, 
in his New York apartment, came up with the wizardry of Maya. And it is truly a low sugar um, yogurt. It's only like two to three grams per serving, so incredibly low. And um, so welcome, Hamilton. Thank you. And Lily, Lily is kind of a hybrid as well, like finance to food. She's conservationist to cheese specialist. She hails from uh, Yukon. She has a degree in environmental science and natural resources. So she started her first part of her career um, with some entities in conservation, lastly being the Connecticut Farmland Trust. From there, we had, of course, COVID. So many, many people, of course, were stranded in their homes. She decided to be entrepreneurial, not knowing what would happen. She merged her, in, her hobby, her new hobby, on her stove as well. She merged the hobby of knowing about environmental science from a knowledge standpoint with her knowledge of growing up on a dairy farm. And together, that became the new wizardry that she would have with her cheese specialist processing, well, specialty cheese processing an artisanal cheese. So that was her beginning. And she actually became a cheesemonger, which is like fishmonger, selling cheese. And then she grew into where she has recently been, up in, way up in Colchester, Connecticut, as the uh, lead cheese specialist and Cato, at Cato, Cato Corner Farm. However, with her still her early on career, she was snagged from Cato Corner after a few years, and she will be going to Wisconsin next month to be a cheese specialist at Blakesville Creamery in Wisconsin. So we're very thrilled for you with this next journey of yours, and welcome. Thank you. Um, and so with that being said, we will start with Hamilton. Um, please take it away with, with well, thank Maya. Thank you for that kind introduction, oh. Lisa. That was more than I was expecting. Oh, yeah. Um, my pleasure. So I, as Lisa hinted, I made, I started to make yogurt in my apartment for my cousin during her first pregnancy. She was really seeking something that was uh, that was not as sugar laden that she could eat uh, frequently throughout the day. And after countless reformulations, we've created the most pristine, creamy, low sugar masterpiece. We've seen exceptional success recently on Fresh Direct. People buy us because of the flavor, because of the creaminess, because of the nutrition, but because they know that we're good for cows. And that's why I'm here uh, to talk to you about the sustainability and all of these better for you um, attributes that a lot of these emerging brands have, like us, that are really propelling, propelling uh, small food brands. Um, Grass-fed cow's milk is better for you, it is better for the cows, and it is better for the environment. Uh, whether it's how the low till that our farmers practice in the fields, or the way that they rotate crops, the way that they're able to transfer the energy from the sun into the soil to then sequester more carbon, there are countless things out there that we could speak to that are just incredibly beneficial um, for this world, but the consumer is just starting to understand what that all means. And simply stated, what that means to her or him is that we're doing the right thing and that she or he should support us. And that's what we're seeing out there. We're seeing a tremendous amount of pull from consumers who are looking to support brands that are doing, making a real difference with a product that's, that's super premium. So there are countless sustainability initiatives that we're taking as a company that we're doing um, that are that are reverberating at, at different levels of, of success. And we're really proud of that. Um, a product is second to none, as I will say, on end. Uh, but what really makes it special is, is the impact that we are having on our communities, uh, on our farms, and on the world. And what we're doing can easily be be done at scale. It just takes a lot more of people like us to support brands like us to get the message out, to stir up the demand, to start to force each level up in the supply chain, uh, whatever that may be, whether it's a food supply chain or a retail supply chain, to actually make a difference. Uh, and the more pressure that we can put on them to do the right things, the better this world will be and the, the quicker we can uh, we can reverse a lot of the, the bads that have happened out there. 
question in terms of, um, I think from what you said earlier, you know, there's a lot of loyalty with, you know, returning, recurring sales. Uh, do you, what do you, do you think, is it just because obviously you've got the superior creamy texture that truly is, is that really the winning factor? Um, could it be a combination of grass fed? With that, is there any, I know you've got like six flavors. Is there any kind of distilling that down any particular point to the loyalty? Um, or is it all the above? Because you do have incredible loyalty, there's no doubt, you know, in terms of the recurring revenues. Uh, yes, everyone buys on taste. Taste okay. is the number one differentiator, and then it has to be nutritious, and the creaminess certainly helps, unless you actually are going to enjoy yeah. eating something every day, literally. Um, you're not going to continue buying it, nor are you going to continue telling your friends. So it is all of the above. But the, one of the big deciding factors, and everyone has a different palate, everyone has different, slightly different views on nutrition, um, but when they can understand that your product is truly differentiated and they can taste the difference, uh, we've noticed that they will support you. And again, it's something that can be done, it can be scaled up. This isn't just a classroom project. This is a, this is, we are one of the many pieces that is going into this whole food supply chain that is, will hopefully make this world a better place in the coming years and generations is because of the pressure that, because of the things that we are doing, that the big guys are changing the way that they are operating uh, at varying speeds and to varying levels, depending upon what their mission is, who their stakeholders are, et cetera. But there's no doubt that when you can go and convince a co-op, co-ops, groups of people, farmers, whomever, to, to help you out, to support you, and when you can make a better product and when you can showcase the value that you're doing that on all of those um, things that we touch and the pillars that we stand on, that we can have a real impact. And this isn't a rah-rah speech. This is, this is a real difference that we can see every single day and we can quantify with the fan mail or the feedback or the repeat sales. We have the highest level of repeat sales on Fresh Direct. We're their fastest growing yogurt brand ever. Um, we're the only yogurt brand who's been brought in to talk to management about how to, how to help grow emerging brands to bring more customers to their platform. We have the highest dollar sales per purchase of any yogurt in the category now. And guess what? We started in the basement. We were dead last. Uh, but this all comes by tell, convincing people to tell their friends uh, to be talking <clears throat> up things that you like, things that you appreciate, whether it's on whatever social platform you you prefer, or whether it's in great co-working spaces, or yeah. whether it's with your family and friends. I'm curious, is there any, you know, I'm going to liken this to being very sane to espressos and coffee, you know, if you have it in a, in a porcelain cup? it tastes different than a, a styrofoam cup, right? It tends to, for people who are into the trades. And I know you use less plastic than almost all of them. Has that ever come up where do you, do you think that that superiority and creaminess ties in with the less plastic? I'm it sure does. You can't, if something looks better, we're human. We are definitely influenced by the way that something feels or the way that something, see how something looks. But our, our cups of yogurt have between 21 and 50% less plastic than the competition. Our two pound tub is 51% less plastic than the other yogurts. Huge. Which is, I mean, if, you know, if we were a Chobani, we would be saving a, a lot of money uh, just in the plastic cost. But I mean, that makes a real difference. And the only way that we're able to do that is to be able to stabilize the cup with a cardboard sleeve that comes from 100% post recycled um, paperboard so that the the container itself is super stable and what that does is it presents a super premium image when we when we print that on that so absolutely the plastic it's a big deal we don't we don't love to use plastic we wish but we could it's, it's but it's bragging rights I mean in the aggregate it's it, bragging it is and rights. what we're doing with some of our suppliers in this we don't generally talk about this because we're at least a year down the road, but we're, we're working with our suppliers to put enzymes in the plastics to accelerate the 
uh, the decomposition rates by somewhere around 10 to 11 times. So if a cup of my yogurt sits in a landfill, which is where they end up sometimes if they're not recycled, it will decompose 95% within 3.9 years. Can you imagine if every landfill that we had out there turned into farmland? You go to an island and you see what happened to the old, old dumps. Yeah, that's so, a real sustainability message. So we're, we're trying to accelerate those, but it's a little premature. But the enzymes exist. We can inject them in the plastic. The plastic has, or our partner suppliers can, and the plastic uh, has real stability and will decompose significantly quicker. So does it, potentially then, does it extend the enzyme life? Because, you know, there's lacto bifidus and um, apparently every day, you know, it can lower, but does less plastic, I just thought of it, does it happen to have any correlation to so oil? these are these are different enzymes these are chemical enzymes that oh, are added to it. a oil based reason that okay. forms plastic but our probiotics and our cultures yeah. so are second it. to none i mean shortly after production we have about 80 billion probiotics per cup which is a substantial amount of standard yogurt that the fda allows to uh, speak about a probiotic claim has about two and a half billion so we have orders of magnitude more probiotics and you don't hear us talking about it primarily because no one understands it but also no one can no one no one's ever going to count to a billion no people just don't understand that yeah. so we don't <laughs> we don't need to talk about that the lovely cows the jersey yes. cows yes. so is there any is there a certain type of one other question is a certain type of breed that gives more of a premium to the yogurt, like a certain breed of the cow? Is that they, they certainly do. Uh, they all had Jersey and Brown Swiss and Guernsey and a few other breeds are the higher, okay. the higher butterfat producers. Uh, this time of year, we're seeing 4.9 to almost 5% coming out of mm. the, coming out of different farms. And they're not most of the farms that we, the family farms that we work with Mm -hmm. aren't pure, don't have purebred uh, But that cows. makes a difference, so. It, it sure does, yeah. Yeah, I thought it might. Does anyone have a, any other questions? Alicia? Or? Oh, sorry. So just for those of us who don't know anything about yogurt, um, can you go through the process of how it's made and maybe how it's, how, why it's differentiated between this and something like Stonyfield? So I would love for everyone in this room to make their own yogurt off of our cultures. You, it will taste better, it will be better for you, and you will love it. But it will be, you'll have a very difficult time getting our pristine consistency. So you're gonna wanna come back to us. <laughs> so you take, so what you do is you take a cup of yogurt or a spoonful of yogurt, put it in your milk, um, heat the milk, so you denature the protein. So instead of a protein doing this, it does this, it gels together, and then you inoculate it with the yogurt. You let it sit. If you have a gas stove, gas range, you let it sit in there overnight. Of course, once you figure it out, you'll start to understand it's too long or too short to control the acidification. You pull it out, you put it in the fridge. That's how you make yogurt. It's that simple. You take milk, denature the proteins, add your cultures and probi probiotics, and let the process happen. What we do so specially uh, and what has taken hundreds of reformulations is we're able to control the acidification. So that means, so you take a, a milk that has a pH around seven, give or take, your take, and then goes down. And then right as it hits about four or five, or eight, four or five on the pH, we're able to control exactly where that is uh, and exactly how, how it behaves. So instead of, instead of it being overly acidic, where you need to add more sugar to to stabilize the pH, but really to make it more palatable, we don't have to do that. That's why our product is really so exceptional. Plus a lot of sugar to boot. Because, because we're able to control the acidification, we do not need to add all the sugar. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just gonna ask, where are you, where are you located? Uh, we're located in Hamden, Connecticut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're manufacturing plants, but all of this. All of our family farms are in Pennsylvania, in the heart of dairy country, mm. middle of nowhere. 
Pennsylvania is has one of the best areas for grass fed cow's milk. I liken it to Ireland because the soil is so sandy or rocky that really nothing else can grow well there. So these farmers who are generational farmers, they they first did that in necessity uh, and now they do it because it's in their lifeblood. Erica. I'm convinced. It was delicious. So there's no reason that you said it's a shop right in Fairfield, right? Oh. We're, we're many, many shop rights. I see no reason to buy Chobani or anything else. It's, it tastes great. The question is now, how do you get the message across to everybody? I mean, I'd rather have grass-fed than anything else. Is, are there any other grass-fed that are identified as grass-fed yogurts? They're inferior. No, <laughs> um, no we support, this is delicious. we support, so thank you very saying. much. And we. And never I'm met just, before I, no, tonight. I'm, yes, you've got my, you, I love yogurt and you've got my vote. We have some strawberry and vanilla in the fridge for you too. <laughs> um, so we love all grass-fed yogurts. They're really important. Um, and this is, it's about how do we get the message out? And part of the reason that we are seeing such tremendous growth right now is what Horizon or Organic, Organic Valley did 10 to 12 years ago in the Whole Foods of the world where they just promoted the heck out of these grass-fed, uh, excuse me, fluid milk brands. So it's because of that momentum that they had that paved the way for us. There are other great grass-fed yogurts out there, not as great, but they either weren't as successful, whatever, because of timing. All right, and we're supporting a Connecticut business. Correct. We are, Pennsylvania we are a Connecticut company. Okay. So our, manuf our, our marketing, our headquarters, our operations, I mean, you could, most companies do their own thing the way that they want to do it, but the brains are here, and yes, you're supporting local, but more importantly, you're putting a better product into your mouth, right. in my mind, right. because, because of the way that we do it. Right. So. <laughs> would, you, would you identify as local or maybe regional? In Pennsylvania, you're really like putting resources into Pennsylvania food economy, right? Given that your farmers are, are based there. So I think that's an important difference. I've never met anyone who could specifically define local. Everyone has right. a different opinion of local. Yeah. If you're Regional out in California, place. local is 500 miles. If you're in northern New England, people tell me it's 200 miles. Right. We have, we have a, a regional system, right? I mean, I think that's a little more, more accurate. But can you, t can you talk about why it's, in, why it's to, um, so I, uh, this so is, we, we, we are a, a big supporter of what Brian and the Department of Agriculture are trying to do. Uh, and we're looking to, uh, to work with them to grow our, our Connecticut, our local agriculture dairy farm. Unfortunately, many years ago, whether it was because Yukon stores shut down their dairy barn, which they mm -hmm. reopened, uh, I think. Yes, but as I was developing the product, they, they were shutting the dairy barn down. Unfortunately, there is, there's not enough land in this state and it requires a lot of land to have grass fed calves. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to preserve the land and we need to do the right thing. And I mean that, and the right thing doesn't mean that you're losing money or that you're not making as much money. It just means that you're doing things differently. And we don't take shortcuts. Uh, and that's part of the reason that we're able to do this so efficiently and effectively, it's because we've created this process that when there are more controls in place and when it's done, when the temperature and the pressure, everything is done the right way, we can make this a better product for cheaper. Uh, but the same principles apply to what we're doing here in the state of Connecticut relative to our land use and in agriculture. We need to preserve the land and to anyone who doesn't understand how important that is is delusional. Sorry. Are you getting support from the state? Like, are you like for the manufacturing? Are you working with the, the people here? That we have line. Ex we have a really special line extension that is targeted at the family, specifically the kids. I'm a father of two very young boys who are probably crying right now, and um, <laughs> and we are we are working with a manufacturer here in the state to be able to source everything to be able to produce the product here, which means that the production jobs themselves are, uh, will, be, will be performed by Connecticut residents. 
mean, I mean, I know there's grants available and things like that. Isn't we're it? we're looking forward to more grant funds being available. Yes. Yeah. But there are grant funds, and they're beginning to. COVID really threw a wrench in the way that everyone looked at food and their food systems, whether you're talking about a Connecticut or a state down south or out west, everyone is now just is, is viewing uh, the future and how do we support that future and how do we do the right thing and everyone has their own view on what the right thing is, but how do we, how do, we do it better and how do we make it more bulletproof and how do there's going to be another pandemic. I hope not, hope not soon, but how do we how do we ensure that we're going to be able to feed ourselves? And also with climate change, right? With the pervasiveness of the floods and droughts, in particular Midwest on over, not, not around here. There's that too. Yeah, I mean, laundry list of things that are happening in the world. And that's why supporting businesses that are doing the right thing, of, you know, very self-serving comments here. Uh, and clearly I have strong opinions on all this stuff, but that's why doing all the right things is so important. It's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling that, that we're not doing more. And now more people are supporting us, whether we're talking about, not to get political here, but super conservatives, they're, actually, they're supporting what we're trying to do. It doesn't mean that it's less profitable. It just means that it needs to be controlled more and, you, and it's just a little harder to do. Mm -hmm. You know, well, mm -hmm. that's the way it is. Yes. Just if, uh, if you can speak more about how you and why you decided on making your product one way versus a different way. So like I know the grass fed and low sugar, non-GMO, et cetera, but not necessarily like organic milk or. All of our milk is different. organic, but we are not USDA certified organic. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay. I have my own opinions on that, but what's most important and to steer your question in the direction that can be most helpful is we listen. We've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. You wouldn't know that by this, but we should listen to everyone who, who has an opinion who wants to help us. So we've been listening to the consumer at the demo table, social, on the street. I mean, I started pitching the product on First Avenue in New York City years ago. We just keep listening. And we're trying to identify, trying to understand what really resonates with her. I mean, 72% of our consumer is female and we are now understanding that the values that we've been, that we try to showcase that we've been talking about are just so important to her. So when she tells us something, you try to identify what is that particular grain that makes that so special. And it's not organic as much as I love organic and I love the environment and fertilizer, every part of organic. There are plenty of organic products that I would never feed my family. So I think that the, I think that the US, what the USDA is doing now and trying to control what's going on that they just started in the last month is really important. But what's important to me is how someone can see something, can understand it and can can then tell their friends. And when we have something special that can be identified truly as grass fed, that is grass fed, then we're in a good place. And I'm sorry, but this is a big country. Every state has a different climate. Grass fed in Georgia is different than grass fed in Missouri. And seven or eight years ago, Whole Foods came to us and said, what is grass fed? And this was seven or eight years ago. And yes, they had to sell to Amazon. So it was probably deprioritized, but their whole messaging nothing has happened with their standard of identity for grass fed as much as that kills me and probably kills a lot of people grass fed is different everywhere i mean it's some people say that feeding your cows hay is is <laughs> it is not grass fed people in georgia no it is <laughs> so so everyone has their their own standard of identity for a lot of things but as long as you stay true and transparent you're doing the right thing but it was because of because of what a select few consumers told us years ago, were we able to identify that grass fed was it. And then once we realized that it was working, we just made it work more, tried to. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank this you, has been Lisa. very good. Excellent. There's plenty of yogurt in the fridge too, yes. strawberry, <laughs> vanilla bean, and please yeah. tell your friends, and we're the number one yogurt on Fresh Direct as well. 
True. Oh, that's and the creamiest, of course. <laughs> he seriously does have cases. One question, I see you see it sell your individual yogurts in cases, but what about your bigger versions? We have two pound tubs, 32 ounces. They're on the website too? They are on our website. Forgot to mention that because they're on the big because we're ha we deliver to everyone. Okay. We have a doctor in Chicago who gets three cases of yogurt a week. Who's yeah. he's a fantastic. I mean, I don't like shipping halfway across the country, especially not in the summer. Yeah. But we have a great direct to consumer portal. My yogurt that store is, yeah. it's not there, um, but that's the the account, and we can deliver you two pound tubs or cases of yogurt. Sounds good. Yes. Are you with any like food or meat delivery? Because I know there's a bunch of them like locally in Hudson Valley, Connecticut, etc. Uh, a lot of them pull from, from Fresh Direct. That's how a lot of people have told us that they get the product. But we don't sell to them directly. We would like to sell to them directly. So if you're on a direct-to-consumer platform, <laughs> tell them that they need to pull in right. our product. There's a, there's a meat delivery. Walden? Walden, yeah. Right. So well, we supply all inches? of the cream for the butter for all of Walden. Oh, really? Oh, good. All of, well, like 90% of it comes from our cap. Comes from our, so what makes us so creamy is the fact that we're able to strain it, and when you strain it, you're left with a very high butter fat product that would, that's less palatable, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's, Thick. So we take a lot of the a lot of the cream and and, and then it goes to all. Okay. Hi Charlie, do we have time for one more question or no? Yeah. Gotta go. Okay. Oh. Well, <laughs> I'm now curious. So you have your farms are based in Pennsylvania and you have a co-op of dairy farmers Correct. and they provide the cream obviously for your yogurt. But that cream goes to a facility in Pennsylvania. Like how does that all they provide the, the milk. milk. I meant to say the milk. I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to say cream. So the, so the milk then goes to a facility within Pennsylvania. So these 11 family farms, that's yeah. now be, soon to become 20. Okay. They, well, get, they get milked in, you know, many times during the day. And then usually in the middle of the night, a big truck. If you go to a gas station, you see one of the big tankers that yeah. holds about 68,000 pounds of gasoline or milk. Okay. And <laughs> not um, the same tank. <laughs> definitely, definitely not in the same tank, and it's pulled in. So when you have forty to a hundred head, that's you know on average seven hundred head. They produce fifty to seventy thousand pounds of milk for us um, on a two-day milking cycle. That goes to our facility. We then separate some of the cream, which then goes to Walden's butter, and some of the cream remains. In our product, we then strain off a lot of the whey. There's whey and casein that are just like the nursery rhyme, and the whey then goes to uh, local farmers to help with the pig feed and to use as a fertilizer once they're nitrates. So there's again this whole sustainability message that it's a little complicated. Most people don't truly understand it, so we don't spend time talking about it. We're trying. What we're trying to do is give people nuggets of information that they can then tell their friends about, not some elaborate process that's, you know, taken a decade to perfect. And all that happens in Pennsylvania? That all happens in Pennsylvania and the butter gets turned in, sorry, the cream gets turned into butter in New York. But and then the yogurt is produced in Pennsylvania? The yogurt is produced yeah, yeah. in the heart of dairy country, central Pennsylvania. And the kids yogurt, Hopefully, we'll still be produced right here. It's truly circular, too. I mean, that's another thing. Yeah, our so carbon footprint, circular. I mean, that we can't even, it's just hard to say everything. Oh, I know. Our carbon footprint is just is so much lower than everyone else. And I mean, part of what makes us so special is the way that our far, our cows treat their, uh, sorry, our farmers treat their animals. <laughs> our cows yeah. treat the farmers. Yeah, our, our cows are amazing they're so domesticated but um part of what when you treat your animals the right way they i mean they've never spoken to us so we don't know that they love to be milked but it looks like they love to be milked all the time they all they want to do is be milked so 
uh, given what I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot, but what's important is that brands like us, and specifically us, are doing really good things for this world, which is why we all need to talk about it. And think back 10 years ago, how many people were talking about food 15 years? Yeah. 10 years ago. So, I mean, they just, they just weren't. Instagram so, has been a big, you know, proponent. Yeah. I, I really I would advocate that you note on your website that you have 11 to 20 family farms between 40 and 100 head. That is like amazing. That is like small scale, extraordinary it, quality, you, super. You can't like, be smaller. And I, I mean, would, up until what would you say, 200 head? You can be. It's classified as small. Yeah, I think it's like two, two, fifty, two. something like that. So Wonderful. it is really important, but. What's more important in my mind, and I'm going to think about this a lot, is showcasing how good of you, how good of individuals these yeah. people are, yeah. and that's what makes, that's why I'm so confident in dairy. It's because the world has stopped vilifying these great people, and God bless vegans and people who, who eat diff who don't like the same food I do, but it's. It doesn't great. take me 60 gallons of water to make one almond. It, there's, yeah, it's, that's a good point. And the yeah. carbon footprint and the... No, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. This has been... Yeah, before I get food out, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you Please so tell much. your friends, mayayogurt.store. I can't yes. believe I forgot that. It's an unforgettable name, Maya. The goddess of... Spring and rebirth. There you go. Yes. Thank you. That should be your Thank logo, you. part of your animation. The goddess. <laughs> Find the goddess. The Tomorrow. animation. Especially if you're catering to women. And we have pro bono. Primarily. Yes. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you so much. Anyway, Thank, you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lily, you are up. And we will have your own presentation <laughs> yeah. if changed. could talk about cheese for like six hours. So when they told me I had like 20 minute presentation, like, 10 minute no. Q&A, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put a lot of this and just go really fast through it. <laughs> so I have some slides to go through and stuff. Cause I like to show you guys the farm, the cows, the people behind it, and a little bit of the cheese making process. Cool. Do I have a little clicker? Do I have a clicker? So um, Cato Corner Farm cheese from pasture to plate. Um, we're a grass uh, pasture-based farm up in Colchester. Um, so if any of you are familiar with the eastern side of the state, we're kind of like between we're like Norwich and Willimannock are kind of in that little area that no one ever seems to really know. Um, but we are there um, along with some other breweries and wineries in town as well, um, which is kind of cool to have this little like fermentation area um, in the middle of the state. Um, so this is actually one of our pastures, obviously not this time of year, um, but in the summertime, this is what our pastures look like um, around the farm. So Cato Corner Farm, um, these are the two owners. Uh, you have Liz Gilman, uh, Liz McAllister, and Mark Gilman. Um, this is a mother and son team. Um, this was all started by Liz McAllister back in the 90s. Um, she got a divorce and then she decided that with that she's just going to farm and put all of her passion and energy into farming. Um, and she's been a lover of animals throughout her whole life. Um, she kind of started in that like back to the land movement of like the 1970s. She just really wanted to be able to provide for her own family and live a sustainable lifestyle herself. Um, so she raised her son, um, and her, she has another son as well, um, kind of on that lifestyle of you grow what you eat, you make what you eat, and you raise animals and whatnot, and it's all kind of like a full cycle throughout the farm. Um, so we've been making cheese since 1997. Um, Mark Gilman was actually uh, an English school teacher down in Baltimore, um, and he decided that he wanted to come back uh, when his mom started making cheese. He was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, so he came back to the farm and now has been the lead cheese maker since. Um, so they kind of split duties. Liz is more on the cow side and he's more on the cheese side um, because really Liz, the whole time, the reason why she started the farm was just because she really loves working with animals. And so in order to work with animals, you gotta you know, make money off of them and do something. And so she decided to go the cheese route 
um, because she just has a particular interest for Jersey cows, which you'll see soon, or you see one right there, um, which is the breed that we 100% uh, work, with, work with on the farm. Um, and so we started in 1997. Um, you can see one of our little markets down here. Um, Liz would literally pack up her little van full of cheese, drive down to the New York City green markets all the way from Colchester, which is like a three, four hour drive um, at like, you know, 2 a.m. to get down to the green markets, set up and sold her cheese at the New York City markets. And that's kind of how she made her na a name for herself. And we still have a stake in those markets today, um, thankfully. And so uh, Cato Corner has been around since, and we've only continued to grow. Um, we now produce annually about 60 to 65,000 pounds of, che of cheese a year. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so if I like stutter a little bit, it's just because of all this mucus in my head. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so we make about 60,000 to 65,000 pounds of cheese a year, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not that much when you're talking about cheese production. Um, there's way, way bigger creameries out there than we are. Um, and we all make it from 45 Jersey cows on our property. So these are some of our ladies lining up. They always like, cows are very um, docile animals and you know, they're kind of pretty low on the totem pole when it comes to predators. Um, and so they really like to go along like the edges of pastures until they get to a safe spot and then they kind of like all go out and, and will enjoy their grass together. Um, so cheese, it all begins with the cows, all begins with the milk. Um, and so we milk 40 to 45 Jersey cows on 75 acres of land. Um, that land is broken up into pasture and woodland, and then obviously the farm creamery and Liz lives on the property, so her farmhouse is also part of that as well. We're on preserved farmland. Um, so back, it's, uh, I think it was like 2010 or so, um, we preserved the farm under NRCS, um, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, which is a federal and um, local state um, organization that focuses on a lot of like soil health and um, environmental health. And so we got um, funds from them to be able to preserve the farmland and keep it as pasture land. Um, so no development can happen on the farm at all. And it also has to be kept into a certain percentage of pasture too. So even people that have it past us, they still have to keep it in a certain percentage of pasture as well. We practice rotational grazing. Um, this helps promote soil health. This helps promote um, forage yields on our property um, to allow the forage to kind of grow back so the animals aren't overgrazing in certain areas. Um, they set, are set up in different paddocks, and you can't see any now, but we have this fencing all lined up, so that way we like open and close the fencing to allow them into certain areas and, and guard them off from other areas. And so we rotate like every eight hours um, during the summertime. Obviously, we're not out on pasture this time of year. Um, but in the summertime, we do that. And um, we recently actually just secured a, a, a grant from the American Farmland Trust um, in order to uh, diversify our pastures for this upcoming year. Um, so we have a lot of cool climate grasses because Connecticut is a cool climate, but with climate change and a lot of droughts that we've been experiencing, uh, we've had a lot of issues with the grasses growing in our pastures, and we've actually had very, very low yields on a lot of our grasses as well, and then that impacts, you know, how we can feed our cows and our milk that comes out of it and everything. Um, so we just got this grant to slowly go through this um, succession uh, process to go from cool climate grasses to warmer climate grasses. Um, that way these droughts that we're having much more frequently um, won't affect us as much as they have been. Um, and then we also work with some other local dairies that have our same values and also our same breed of cows um, in order to make some of our pasteurized milk cheeses. Uh, because Cato Corner since the very beginning has been a raw milk cheese producer um, and within the last like four years um, we started also making pasteurized milk cheeses because here in the United States, if you want to make anything fresh or young or soft, it has to be made with pasteurized milk from federal law. Um, and so in order for us to diversify kind of our catalogs of cheeses, we have to get into pasteurized milk as well. Um, and for those, most of the time, we um, source the milk from Sweetgrass Creamery over in Preston, Connecticut, which is again in that little bubble of the state that um, on the eastern side. Um, so that helps not only, you know, keep us going, but also helps keep that farm going because we buy milk from them. We're, um, you know, honoring their values and also giving them some money to, you know, keep on dairy farming themselves as well. Uh, Lily, just a quick question yeah. with that. Um, I was rather surprised with the drought. 
we don't have that at all here. I mean, I think the last time it was, and I think it wasn't it wasn't red alert, but it was probably like uh, yellow to red. We're talking like 2018, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So you don't. We get a lot of rain down here, mm -hmm. and at times torrential rain. We did Saturday with flood warnings. Yeah. Up there, it's just so surprising. Is it more of a drought wherever those currents so are? Been, I mean, it kind of you know waxes and wanes. Like mm -hmm. I mean, right now, obviously, we're in having a crazy amount of rain, and mm -hmm. all of our pastures are soaking wet. Even if it was a sunny day, we probably still wouldn't let the cows out because they would just you know make the mud out of the pasture. Um, but we have dealt with a lot of drought um, the past few years. Um, like, I think it was last year or the year before, like, our pastures were just burnt. Like, the, with the sun on top of just, like, very little rain, our pastures were just burnt. And it was very sad to be buying hay in the middle of the summertime when your pasture should be super lush and green, and that's what the cow should be eating. Um, and a lot of even our, like, hay producers, where we get our hay from, um, some from Connecticut and then others from, like, the Hudson Valley of New York and stuff like that, even they were having issues, too. Um, so it kind of comes and, and goes, like, we'll be in a drought for, you know, like, the month of July and month of August, but then all of a sudden September comes around, and we get, like, six inches of rain. So it's really, it kind of, um, you know, yeah. Because it depends, too, I guess, on the, produ the production of the high season with production as opposed to low season. So mm -hmm. if high season is not... Is more in the spring won't matter yeah know? yeah so so yeah we, we pay attention a lot of close attention to like the health of our pastures because really that that is, goes to the health of our cows and you know how good of cheese we can make and stuff like that so. thank you yeah um so this is just a little snapshot of the cows diets um throughout the year um so from may to november the cows are out on pasture they're enjoying all the fresh grass eating wildflowers and other plants um, <laughs> Cows get into some nice spring onion. You can taste that in their milk. It's great. <laughs> um, so they're they're just kind of foraging on a bunch of different species out there. And then from November to April, we're in Connecticut. It's winter time um, or a pseudo winter time. Um, and the cows come off pasture and they're eating local hay, either from Connecticut, like I said, or from more of like the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, and then they get also supplemented with a little bit of grain or other supplements like beet pulp and stuff just to ensure they're getting all the nutrients that they need. We never feed fermented foods to our cows, so they never get silage, haylage, baleage, any of the edges. Um, <laughs> they just get um, fresh pasture or hay. Um, so we do call them grass-fed, um, although I'm not sure what the exact like FDA definition of grass-fed is, but to us, this is what a, gra a grass-fed animal um, is raised as. Um, so now we head to the milking parlor. So we went from the pastures, and now we're coming inside to the cows getting milked. Um, we name all of our cows. This one's named is Tequila. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and cows are milked twice per day, so they're milked in the morning, and then they're milked in the evening time. That also usually lines up with us rotating the pastures in the summertime as well, which is really nice. And they produce about 50, uh, 30 to 50 pounds of milk per day, depending on the time of day and also like the stage of lactation that they're at. If they're super um, fresh into their lactation, they have a lot of water in their milk, so it's like very, very high volume. Towards the end of lactation, they tend to have a little bit less in their milk, um, and so kind of wanes as well. And then health and hygiene is about utmost important, especially because we are making raw milk cheeses, the most of our cheeses. Um, so there's no like protection level, like at least pasteurization, you're killing off everything, anything good or bad in the milk. But with raw milk, like this is right here, our key control point is how like healthy our animals are and how clean they are coming into the milking parlor and taking care of all of our systems in there, like the, the, um, the claw there and everything. And so this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's by Clifton Fadiman. Um, cheese is a milk's leap towards immortality. Um, so cheese is a way to take this very, very perishable product and change it into something that can stick around for a few weeks to a few months to even several years. Um, so this is just like, to me, a very special way of thinking about cheese. And that's kind of how cheese started way back when. Like the Romans is one of like the biggest kind of thing that everybody thinks of. It's like Roman warriors with just like parm in their pockets at all times. Um, <laughs> and it's because it's such a good source of nutrition and it's something that is easily carried around. And otherwise, like what would you do with all this fresh milk? Um, and if you change it into something that you can have for a long time, you're just getting continual use out of it. Um, so now we're into the raw milk cheese making room. This is me over here. Um, this is my coworker Chris, who's actually the lead raw milk cheese maker. Um, and you can see this is our cheese vat, and then we have our forms over there, which all the curds go into to get the shape of the cheese. 
and then behind there you see all those bars, that's our press to press the cheese. Um, so in here, cheese undergoes no heat treatment. Um, the, like literally there's a wall right here and then there's the milking room. So there's like a little line that just goes through the wall from the milk tank room into the cheese room right into that vat. So it's a very like three foot pathway from, from the milking room to the cheese making room. Um, and here the milk gets to retain all of the native microbiota, um, all of those nuances um, that come with the milk. And we get to make um, semi-soft, firm, and hard cheeses in here. Then we go into the pasteurized cheese making room. Um, this was more my domain um, that I've been working in most of the time at Cato um, because this is the newest part of Cato. Um, so I was kind of coming in as like the first person to make the pasteurized milk cheeses for them. Um, so in here, the milk does undergo heat treatment. Um, this kind of makes a clean slate for cheese making. Again, in order to make any fresh, soft, or young cheese um, in the United States, we have to pasteurize the milk. So if it was up to us, we would just make everything with raw milk, but fortunately, there are federal laws. Um, <laughs> and so um, in order to uh, legally pasteurize milk, we have to keep it to certain temperatures for a a certain period of time. Um, so this is called a vat pasteurizer. So the milk is in here. You create a closed system. Um, and the milk itself, the temperature is on your left, <laughs> um, 149 degrees. And then on the other side is the airspace above the milk. And that has to be about at least higher than 150. Um, and so that has to be kept for 30 minutes time. And we have our little chart recorder there that shows us our legal record. That way, no one can ever come at me and be like, you didn't pasteurize this milk properly. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, and we make our soft and fresh cheeses in this room. So just quickly on the cheese making uh, process, just because I feel like a lot of people don't understand how milk goes from a liquid to a solid to this like beautiful piece of cheese that's sitting on your plate. Um, so you start off by adding cultures up in the corner there. That's my coworker Chris again. Um, and you add different cultures for different reasons. Um, you have like your lower temperature cultures or your higher temperature cultures. Um, depending on the type of cheese that you're making. Also the fermentation rate, so kind of like how quickly they're acidifying um, and making your lactic acid and stuff within your milk um, for different flavors and textures. Um, or you can do single strains versus special mixes, which you can mix yourself or buy them pre-mix. Then you go into coagulation. So now this is like a coagulum of the milk. Um, and you can see there's kind of like this little slit in it. That's how we kind of check that the milk has set and that it's ready to be cut in the curds. Um, so coagulation happens just through a rennet. It can be animal or vegetable based. Um, and you add it to the milk. Um, when it's in liquid form, you let it set for X period of time, depending on what cheese you're making. And then it turns into a solid. And that's why this incredibly lengthy process of like these proteins kind of acting on each other with the help of the enzyme from the rennet. And it creates this curd matrix, um, which then kind of like tightly wraps all of the proteins and all of the fats and some other nutrients into the matrix. And that's how you end up with your curd. And then you get into curds and whey. Um, so this is, this is our old cheese making vat before we're now in that big round one. Um, but this is us cutting the curd with what's called a cheese harp. Um, and that's how we cut them. And we cut them to very specific sizes depending on the cheese that we're making and how we manipulate the curd, whether that mean by um, increasing temperature, stirring for long periods of time, or um, uh, looking for certain textures and acidity levels like your pH and stuff like that. And then from this, you get your curds and your whey, and all of our whey actually gets fed back to our ladies. Um, so this pipe connects to the cheese making room. We have a little pump in the cheese making room that pumps it out, and we call it tea time. Um, <laughs> and they literally come running for it. Like they hear the pump go on and they're just like, it's time. Um, they love it, especially like this is like a snowy day over here and like you can just see the steam coming off of the way. So they get just their like nice little hot tea break in the middle of the day. Um, this also is like a nice closed system of us just like feeding kind of back to, to our animals. We also have a pig farmer um, down the street as well that will come and pick up whey for his, for his pigs as well which then we sell his uh, pork at our farm shop. So you had your, you cultured your milk, you coagulated your milk, you cut your curd, and now you're into pressing and shaping. Um, so there's various different sizes that we can make of um, cheeses. The two on the um, left over there, there's about 25 to 30 pound wheels. And then these over here are about like 1.2 pound wheels. Um, so it varies a lot in the sizes of cheeses that we're making. 
and then salting cheese. Um, so you can either brine, um, let the salt kind of slowly penetrate through the wheels of cheese, or you can dry salt the cheese where you're just manually um, rubbing the salt all over the cheese. And then we go into the cave, um, the art of affinage. Um, so that just comes from the French term affineur, um, which means to refine. Um, and this is our owner, Mark Gilman. He's coring. This is called coring a piece of cheese on a very fancy device called a cheese trier. And it's just literally because it lets you try the cheese. <laughs> it's very, very fancy terminology here. Um, so this is just a little glimpse of our cheese caves. Um, so we have all the different molds, yeasts, bacteria um, that are just growing, and kind of develop their natural rinds and develop flavor. Um, these two over here, um, what she's doing over here and this cheese right here, these cheeses we kind of um, like manipulate to get the very specific brines that we want. What she's doing is she's washing a cheese. Um, so she's literally taking like a brine solution and washing the molds off the cheese to kind of create this like very, very, very tacky texture to it. So if you've ever had like Telegio or Munster or anything like that, they're kind of smelly too. Um, those are the cheeses that she's making there. This one. It's a classic camembert style, so we want that nice fluffy white rind that everyone associates with like a brie, a camembert, and everything. Um, whereas then we get to our natural rind cheeses, where we just kind of let them do whatever they want. Um, <laughs> they kind of just like take on the native microbiota that's just around them at the time. We don't do much to manipulate the rinds on those guys, because they just kind of come out how they kind of let them, we call our cave very like punk rock. Um, it just kind of uh, goes with its own flow and whatever succession kind of happens with the molds and yeast, we just let it happen. Um, and so cave duties include like turning, flipping, brushing, washing, um, and poking. Like we poke blue cheese in order to get that blue mold to, to grow on the inside and stuff like that. Um, and that's cheese. Um, and we already tasted. And if you haven't tasted yet, um, so I have two cheeses out there. Um, and if you, I hope you guys look at them um, and kind of see the little color difference that's between them. Um, so the duller one, um, the woman Chago, that one was made in December of 2023. And then the other one, the Age of Bloom's Day, was made in May of 2023. Um, so that's when the cows are on grass in May versus the cows inside on hay um, in December. And that just comes from what they're eating. So um, with cows, a lot of the, um, the chlorophylls come through in their milk. And so you can see that color difference um, in the milk when they're on grass. Um, it comes out like almost comically yellow sometimes in the summertime. Like I've gone to like cheese events and stuff and I've had the cheese out and cheese makers will literally come up to me and be like, do you dye your milk? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's literally just the color of our milk. Like it's so, it's very, very vibrantly yellow. Um, that's just from our beautiful pasture grasses. Um, and then in the winter time, when they're just on hay, there's not as much of that color coming through in their, in their feed, so it doesn't translate as much into their milk. Um, and Jersey cows specifically have very, very high butter fat in their milk, um, and a lot of that color latches onto butter fat. So even like a Holstein, the typical black and white cow, that is 100% grass fed, and say we raise the, the Jersey cow, the Holstein cow with all of our jerseys, that milk from the Holstein would still not be as yellow as the Jersey cow, just because the Holstein has lower butter fat, and so there's not that color attaching to, to the way that it does in a Jersey cow. So, and then also just some contact information for us, <laughs> some of our little babies. Um, so there's some contact information over there, email, Instagram, and Facebook, and then a little bit about um, where you can find us at like farmers markets and everything. Um, we do, if any of you live around here, we are at like the Fairfield Greenwich cheese shops. Um, we love Laura, <laughs> she's the owner there. Um, and she supports us throughout like the very beginning. Probably in the Darien cheese shop, I'm thinking. We are a little bit in the Darien cheese shop, but Laura definitely carries, at Fairfield Greenwich yeah. carries more of our, of, of our line. Um, and so if you guys are ever in the New York City, um, we're at the Green Markets um, every Saturday as well. Union Square. We're at Union Square. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Are people allowed to pet the cows? Yeah, people come and pet the cows. Um, we've had a lot of um, like vet students and like other people come to our farm and they've told us they've never met more docile cows than our cows. And I think it's because our cows just see so much human interaction. They're literally just dogs and howling. It's, oh. it's crazy. <laughs> Good follow well, opportunities. The owner's love for them. That's yes. Right. Yeah. No. The the love for these cows is like tenfold. It's it's amazing. How old? What's her average age? Um. So Jersey 
cows in general can live up to like 16 or so. Okay. Um, so I don't know what the oldest cow that we currently have is, um, but I know she's in her like 11th lactation, um, which is pretty pretty good for, for okay. a cow. <laughs> Same something for her health. Yes, yes. I've got one question with the oldest cheese because I remember there was something with aging. What's the oldest? Is there so the, five years? Or is there... The oldest cheese that we produce is about a year old. Just because we are such a small farm, we don't have like the real estate to hold on to those cheeses for so long. And because we are continually producing, um, just because we can't go in and tell the cows like, hey, just we can't make cheese today, so just don't, you know, don't milk. <laughs> um, so we are continually producing, so we have to kind of have cheese coming in and out of our caves pretty regularly. So the youngest we'll do is our fresh feta, which is like a day old. We can start selling it. Um, all the way up to like our dairy air reserve um, is like about a year old. Um, and the aged bloomstay that is on the plate out there is like 10 months old right now. Um, so that's the most that we go, but like on general market, you can find cheeses that are like, Five years old, ten years old. Is that the difference kind of with um, Europe cheeses as opposed to US that are older? Um, so like broken fur? No, so I mean you can find a parm right? Yeah, you can find parm that's really old or even like a year old. Um, but that kind of changes depending on just like what the type of cheese is. Like you're not gonna hold on to certain cheeses for a long period of time. Okay. Um, so it really more depends on like the type of cheese and just also like who the consumer is that you're trying to. I mean, it would um, seem like it's like blue veined cheese would be the older cheese. No, those are actually pretty young. Okay. Yeah, like our blue cheese, for example, is uh, like two and a half to three months when we sell it. Okay. Okay. Is anyone other questions or? <laughs> Why? Okay. Yeah, I guess I could ask you maybe the same question as Hamilton, like how did you decide on doing or how did the farm owners decide, owners decide to practice certain um, aspects of sustainable farming? Versus, yeah. Um, yeah. Versus, and I love your earrings. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> um, so I think it really comes down to like, so Liz, the woman you saw earlier, like this is her home. Like she lives here. And so she's not going to live here and not do anything that she wouldn't want to do or that she doesn't want to see. And so like these cows are literally treated like gold. <laughs> I've never seen cows treated so well. Um, and she just loves these animals so much. Like she treats them literally like her children. Um, and so she cares for them like hand and foot. And so we also really just wanted to make sure that it was as close system as we can make it. Um, given just kind of like the infrastructure of it and also just like what we need to buy in just for the purpose of like making cheese and packaging and all that stuff. Um, but like we get to feed our way back to the, to the animals. Um, we have all the pasture right there for them to eat. Um, so she just really treats it, you know, as it is her home because it is. Um, and so it's really, it's very traditional farming. Um, this isn't like, you know, a dairy farm that um, you know, they just purchased and, and are just doing it because they want money or anything. It's literally just like it's a passion for them and, and they love living off the land. Well, all right then. Thank you so much. <laughs>